Okay, we, we finished. We are still with the premises and uh, we were mentioning that we need suitable conditions and control, of course. And what I wanted to point out below that all samples, reagents and the measurement standards and reference materials, they must be stored as to ensure their integrity. And samples, they need to be stored in such a way to pre prevent also cross-contamination. And what I learned from being in the laboratories is that the reference material or certified reference material has a special requirement that it should be um, have a separate storage uh, facility like a separate fridge mm -hmm. if, if this is possible and it has to be lockable. Yeah. yeah. And this is also very expensive and I think um, many follow this um, we come later to the reference materials because they also need of course to be stored as, as they are required and they need to be labeled and it has to be clear what you take out of course and that you don't no longer use it above shelf life but since it's very expensive and the traceable standard it has to follow certain um, conditions. Okay, the, the manual has also chapter on hygiene and safety and I have summarized here some of the, um, um, the uh, points or aspects we, we are mentioning that is working with but the pathogens. You're, you should work in a biosafety level two condition or with a laminar flow. I will show you later the conditions for biosafety level one and then two. And um, you should have a documented cleaning program. I put there per room. It should have a general one and then for the chemistry, for instance, a separate one. Uh, rules for environmental monitoring and the possibility of cross-contamination. Then procedures for the dealing with the spillages. Protective closing adequate hand washing facilities and then maybe policies how to do this because I saw from you very super hand washing <laughs> like before operation I was really impressive but okay since we we needed more for the for the microbiology of course and then um, you, you should have also basic rules and, and organization also of the occupational health and safety requirements. And I'm not sure this also relates to the national legislation. So in Germany, we have strict requirements, maybe you too. Um, I don't know, we need to, to also have this um, safety data sheets uh, present where we handle chemicals and uh, you could hang it or have it somewhere close by and the personnel should be trained on this. Then procedures in place to deal with the potential hazards and then uh, procedures for uh, decontamination. And all the personnel should receive the relevant updated information as necessary. Um, there should be a technical manager or someone who is in charge for this, giving instructions. As we discussed yesterday, I was checking on the different requirements because for the biosafety level one and two, um, there are some kind of classifications it, uh, for the um, set of biocontainment precaution requirements. It ranges from biosafety level one to four. And there is some um, specification by the US. It's done by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And the EU has its own um, directive on it. And for the biosafety level one, which is suitable for work with the well character characterized agents, which pose minimal potential hazard to laboratory personnel and environment. We have limited precautions um, as um, written there. You have to wash hands upon entering and exiting the laboratory. You can work on standard open laboratory benches without the use of special containment equipment. No eating, no drinking. 
Yeah? Potential infectious material must be decontaminated before disposal. And you need only personal protective equipment when you might be exposed additional to some hazardous uh, material. And you must have a door that can be locked to limit the access to the laboratory. But um, your um, part where you do the an analysis must not be isolated from the general building. So I guess this is what most of you are doing. This is biosafety level two. This includes work with the microbes that cause mild disease to humans or are difficult to contract via the aerosols in a laboratory setting. This is, for instance, for hepatitis. You wouldn't, um, and then pathogenic E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. This is what you were mentioning, Christina, and Salmonella. And the precautions are the same like for biosafety level one, but then additional, um, you need to have a certain specific training in handling the pathogens. Um, and this must be directed with advanced training. So training is important and some instructions. Then the access to the laboratory is limited when work is being conducted. There should be no interruption, of course. And extreme precaution must be taken with contaminated sharp items and the procedures include um, bio biological safety cabinets or I mean they were not really 100% directed but so why advice to work in the biosafety level 2 under biosafety level 2 in this um, um, lamina flows what you did this has a HEPA filter for instance, and, and when we, what you often see, this really needs to have a maintenance. I mean, you also need to, to control the environment and the filter needs to also be changed. Yeah. Because yeah. your work also, this is quite, um, and uh, you have to set also the limits when you, when you want to change the filter. Mm -hmm. And um, this has to be done by the producers of this biosafety cabinet. It's kind of filtered airflow. Okay, now very important is the personnel. As we saw from the facilities, equipment, the customer requirements, the personnel doing the work. It's a very important laboratory resource and we have requirements on the staff, also the qualification and the number of staff working in the laboratory. And there's also part on staff training. Um, training should be ongoing because the challenges are ongoing. We have a lot of changes, you know, that the, the world is not standing still. We have a new, new things, new requirements, new chemicals, new media and maybe methods. So there should be staff training should be well considered by the top management. And what the laboratory has to ensure is the competence of all who operate the specific uh, equipment, perform tests, evaluate the results and also sign the test reports. Very often signing test reports is a higher ranking um, activities because in, with this also you verify the results and <coughs> also recruiting and retraining qualities, uh, qualified staff is um, essential and it's a specific ISO requirement. So you need to have a certain number of staff to cover your workload and you need to train all the employees in their specific duties. I mean, you wouldn't find also microbiologists who who works on the HPLC and so on and so forth. This uh, would depend also on your laboratory. At the end of the day, what, what is required it is someone could handle the equipment and, and knows uh, what they need to do. And they need to be capable to operate the equipment.
So what you need is uh, training and then job descriptions. I, I normally, if you if you look for personnel and you have your tasks and duties, you you need a certain kind of qualification. If you uh, have to fill a post in microbiology, you would need someone or would like to have someone who knows about the basics, the theory, and who is able to to cover the main. Uh, main tasks in a, a, a micro laboratory and also could has all the techniques and um, nonetheless if you find such personnel which I don't know it's not always easy then you need to have orientation for the new employees they need to be uh, well worked in and there's also um, staff supervision and um, you need to co evaluate the competence of laboratory uh, of personnel in your laboratory as well. And uh, as I mentioned, um, continuous education update always uh, the skills and knowledge. And <coughs> as um, essence, the laboratory should have a staff training program. It has, of course the management has the policy goals procedures for identifying training needs and providing the training. So this is for instance also one training we are doing for instance. I don't know it would, if it fits your need totally but it could also be a special training on HPLC, another training on um, troubleshoot, how to evaluate um, in the microbiology or new trends and but what is um, needed is that all personnel have received the adequate training for the competent performance of tests and operation of the equipment. So if you start for instance, um, if you point someone and he doesn't know much about microbiology then, yeah, you need to train them more, you need to supervise, you know, you, you spend also some of your resources, of course, and, and to, to see that, you, that this person gets more competent in what they are doing, and um, this is then the other option you are having. I mean, you either find a qualified personnel and uh, or you work the person in and they work for a certain time with the supervision. As I mentioned also, um, you, the competence... So, for some time, qualified person is not required, but I prefer to use the word experienced person. Yes. Because if you get someone that is qualified, but they are not experienced yes. in performing yes. tasks. I think this is also very important, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, of course, if, if you now, uh, I mean as a laboratory, if you need to f fulfill uh, position, you know, and then you look for someone, of course, you want someone who is qualified and experienced yes. that already could start working as it's needed, yeah, and if not, um, but also the young personnel needs to gain experience, but in, in microbiology is a lot, lot of experience, I think. And, and what I learned working uh, with groups or in laboratories, I find it also important that you know the background of tests, mm -hmm. you know, because it's always very little or limited what you might learn. You need always to have the background, why you do this, why you evaluate this, what is behind. And therefore I'm much for trainings, but it also has a high cost. And then if laboratories work really on some economic edge, then it's also difficult to always go to trainings. But what, what um, for instance, ISO standard wants is um, that you know where your personal R is and what are the needs for training. So you have to monitor the stuff and you have to um, f uh, more or less formalize the training needs. So if the laboratory is uh, situation, uh, situated in a bigger organization, very often y the human resource department is handling the, the personnel 
and um, there should be a procedure for the review and performance and retraining for personnel and um, how you would um, per more or less oversee that a person is competent. So some let them participate in proficiency tests, for instance. If the results are favorable, you know, I mean, because this is the only external quality control we are having. And um, okay, it relates also to the equipment and the method, but uh, participation in interlaboratory uh, comparison or MPTs could show competence of uh, personnel, for instance. Anyhow, how you review based on the results or your findings, you have to formulate training and you need to, <coughs> or the laboratory needs to have an up-to-date record on the training of each member of the laboratory. I've seen this also with accreditation, this is really checked because it's considered as a very important resource in, in the laboratories. And um, normally there should, a record should be about, for all of you working in the laboratories, on your qualification, the course you have in, attended, on the job training, possible participation in NPT or quality control. And also, uh, I mean, some of you could also publish for instance, if um, there might be problems with one method in HPLC, then the, the, the management could decide that training is needed um, in, in HPLC technology. So, Because um. what the ISO <laughs> wants is really a procedure. You know, you have your personnel and then you evaluate where where are you what are your needs and then you come up with a training a training plan for the next year in general um, more or less these areas are covered you know by training and then it's being tailored to the staff to the personnel and and this is of kind of how it, how it sh should be like a procedure you know like you really look at where you are and what the needs are and where you want to go. Well, so if you want, for instance, enter into GMO uh, or PCR um, technology, then you need to have personnel who is capable to do this. It's either you hire personnel or you kind of educate them. But when I, I looked in our labs and official labs, that they can train inside the lab. Also, yeah, yes. Comes, yeah. They realize, oh, the lady knowing HPLC is living, and nobody knows that. Mm. So you have to start training people inside the lab with all the techniques that are applied. And if you start with that, I think that the, the upper level of chiefs and whatever will know that, okay, you are, all of you were trained in all the assays done in the lab, so now you will need outside training. Because if not, they say, okay, do you know HPLC? No. And PCR? No. Okay, start training yourself mm -hmm. how the chief of each area can make trainings for the other uh, part and personnel of the lab. Mm -hmm. And if you start with that, what we saw in Argentina, is that the head of the labs, maybe some political places, they say, okay, my lab has grown, all the people is trained, they all receive certificates, so now they start asking for outside training. Yes. So uh, I, I think mm. this, uh, we can start with inside training, and that's very cheap, you can do it in uh, maybe in one hour, in two hours, in three days of a week, you take one hour. So uh, I think you have to, to start with that, because if not, there's no money in these countries. Um, all the, 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 the trade people are outside, so you have to move, and it's a lot of investment. Yes, of course. So, and then ask the providers to provide you of that knowledge. Yes, 
In-house training, of course, but it's also good to know where are the training needs. For instance, measurement uncertainty, but then also who does, who is calculating measurement uncertainty in my laboratories w would not always uh, be all of you. So you decide also um, who is doing what in my laboratory. Like um, normally you have a, a technical, I also want you to have a technical manager or technical management, depends on the departments. And they are the ones leading more or less the technical department, deciding about validation, validation plan, performance criteria, also maybe to calculate measurement uncertainty. And the laboratory might have a strategy who is doing this, you know, and they, they then would need to have maybe some training, which could be outside. Or donors are there, but then you need to formulate really your training needs as well. Okay, personnel is, uh, there's a lot about it in, in the ISO and um, to consider. And everything needs to be recorded. Your training um, course, the contents, uh, then you have to have the certificate. Um, the next point we, we have handled is equipment. Equipment, uh, your laboratory shall be furnished with, with all items of equipment or instruments you need to have to in order to be able to carry out the test methods you you want to do and this relates to sampling if you are involved sample preparation measurement and um, also the, the software the belongs always to equipment so nowadays instruments have more and more software so this should be included always your equipment and the software needs to be suitable for achieving the required accuracy. So if you want, for instance, to test this for heavy metals and low, um, low detection limits, you need to have a certain AAS with the detection system. You always have to see or be sure what you need, you have to comply with the specification relevant to the test and the equipment needs to be calibrated. Then what ISO 17025 wants is the unique identification of each item of equipment and the software used that is significant to the result. So you don't give a number to the classware or so, I mean. It's only for certain bigger relevant uh, equipment. Um, then w what's also required that the operation instrumentation shall be available and also this um, instruction. You need to establish a calibration program in your laboratory. We will come to this later, which um, is um, might also be not so easy if you don't have a national metrology in your country institute. Um, okay, what normally the, the instruments should be operated by authorized personnel using up to date instructions. So, what I know from laboratories, chemistry departments, quite often a person is assigned to the equipment. Yeah? You are responsible for the HPLC, you are responsible for the AAS, and, and, and they also run the tests. So and they need also to have the updated instructions. And the, the, the labor laboratories allow to use this equipment only the authorized personnel. Then you need to have maintenance rec of maintenance and uh, records of equipment. So if you start buying equipment, you, you have to make sure really um, that you buy the adequate equipment. Very, I, I don't know, very often I was involved in tenders for equipment for countries, also for the, the fish laboratories, and quite often some consultant does the, maybe does the specification for the equipment, 
but it's quite relevant to consi consider that you select the equipment that you really need, yeah, really. And therefore, you need to know a little bit more about the equipment, need to know also the installation requirements that it, it might need maintenance, what are the costs maybe, what calibration it needs. And um, therefore, the advice is that the laboratory itself um, is more or less involved also in the equipment selection uh, and, and also purchase. There should be someone who knows about equipment. Yeah, and this, yeah, it sounds little, but I know if uh, you have many options and then if you look, for instance, on, on the EU requirements, what is needed, um, you, you will see you might have HPLC, but you have UV detection and you need another kind of detector, for instance. And then it also depends on what you're doing in total in your laboratory. So this sh should be considered, then procedu procedures should be in place for maintenance, troubleshooting, service and repair. <coughs> and you need to have best equipment management program so that your performance is always good. This um, might help you to reduce variation in the results. It gives you also more confidence and lower the repair costs and it reduces interruption. So if a laboratory has a good capacity, they have such programs all the time. Someone is coming, helping, checking on the equipment. What you do with your equipment, you assign responsibilities, you train the persons that operate and main, um, do the main, uh, operate and do the maintenance. I, I don't know if you have a certain department for maintenance. E equipment verification, the equipment needs to be in a state of maintenance and calibration. And it needs some kind of inspection and intervals to look at, which you do in your laboratory. And I put you some lists in here in, in the manual, um, how, how intervals are carried out. I mean, this re relates also on other aspects on, on, on the equipment and, and um, on the type of equipment and how you use it. And there, there are some examples provided that you might use. This is besides having the traceable calibration. This is for instance, if you have incubators or the wa water bars, you, once in a while you need to, to empty the water, clean it, otherwise you have contamination or you have residues in. So, so these are the things you do routinely, routinely in your laboratory and um, you set the requirements and the frequency. This is not written somewhere. You need to follow um, the instructions of, of the suppliers and you... And um, also I took things out of guidance documents and you might be able to also take your own... You, to apply your own system with the checks. And... Um, decide in, in, in your structure who is doing this. And then it always needs to be recorded. This is um, guidance also on the equipment verification and vali validations. For instance, colony counters, are they still working? You check against the number of counted manually and you do this once a year. The safety cabinets, you do environmental monitoring. I mean, this is only examples are in the manual. And what you also do with other requirements for the equipment, you need to have a procedure for safe handling, transportation, storage use, and planned maintenance to prevent the deterioration. And you remove equipment from the place if it's not functioning or needs service. So ISO 17025 was quite 
uh, strict on it. It's either you label it market, but I think good is also to remove the equipment then from the laboratory that it's not standing around. Yeah. You have to do the identification of the calibration status on the equipment should be labeled. We come to calibration later. And safeguard equipment against uh, un unintentional adjustments. And when it goes outside the control of the laboratory um, and comes back, you need to check the calibration again. And these are other smaller things regarding equipment. What you can do and should do, or some are doing, is preventive maintenance. This is the systematic and routine cleaning, adjustment, replacement of equipment parts at a certain uh, scheduled interval. This is recommended by manufacturers. I mean, they, they will tell you if you buy HPLC or other equipment what you need to do, exchange when and what. And very often it's undertaken at intervals of six, six months. And external trained engineers coming. This is what we, we were saying. It's also quite, could be quite expensive in the beginning if you purchase equipment. It's, it's part of the package deal quite often that you have a one or two years uh, service and maintenance, but after this, um, this has to be decided by the management whether to do it or not. So for the equipment and the instruments um, qualification, you always need records at, at the place of the instrument or equipment. This is again ISO 17 or 25 requirements that you you could have this recording at the place where you work or in, in the laboratory, so, but you need to know where it is. The, the records of the equipment include the identity of the item, then the manufacturer's um, date identification, check um, that the equipment complies with the specification, then the instruction, the manual should be also there. Then all certificates you would need or reports for the calibration, adjustment, the acceptance criteria, also the, the calibration if required, the maintenance plan, and any, you also record in, in one form, um, any um, damage, uh, malfunction, modification or repair that happened or when the equipment was out of order. So and this all is, um, is being done for all the equipment that are relevant for your tests and you carry out. And this is more or less um, under the responsibility of the one who is working on the equipment, which should be is assigned. So in, in case of Trinidad, if you all rotate, then this has to be assured that it's on the place, that the next could follow up. I didn't understand. For certification, you need a local metrology lab? No, we come to this later. It's calibration. Ah, OK. But you know. No, normally um, you need to calibrate the balances, um, um, for instance, and you need to calibrate traceable yeah. to the SE units, yeah. which are uh, for the weights, they are in Paris. And normally what you do, you give reference with some secondary or primary standard, um, which is here would be in the country. So you would ha have, for instance, in San Vincent, a metrology institute that has the traceability with their weights to the weights in I Paris. In and all for countries, you have this metrology official lab? It's, it's, uh, this was what we discussed before. I was asking, and I heard we don't have it. In most, in most other countries, the Bureau of Standards. You have a bureau, lab. but it, you know, you need to do this in an accredited lab. So yes. if you. Yes, but no, I, I've never seen that, that locally. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. 
from the area. So we brought with PTB, for instance, three laboratories in Ghana and West Africa to accreditation in weight, volume, so it's, uh, and what was the temperature? And you know, and they, they keep the tra traceability chain to the original SE units. And then if, if, you, if they do this and they are accredited, then they can serve their own country. And then it's internationally accepted. We come to this, if not, you need to, to have a service. So it could also be private. Could be also a company that offers this service. We just had some company uh, from Germany uh, doing the weight calibration for certain laboratories. So then they come to your place. Yeah, you send it to Germany. Okay, but you cannot send the balance. This is the problem. But uh, then you have the weights. But we did the balance. You then someone is coming coming and, and is doing all your balances. They check accuracy, they have to calculate the measurement uncertainty, and they bring all these weights that go back to the weights in Paris. And they, you know, then you have to um, consider when you do this that there's no vibration in the room. You have to consider the humidity, because this is very relevant that your balance, if you want to weigh two kilogram, that it's, it's two kilogram. <coughs> now the point with the reactions in culture media, since we cover microbiology and chemistry, um, um, we need to have a word on the reactions in culture media in the microbiology. The quality is really relevant of, of the media and, and, and culture media and the reagents. And you need to have a procedure in place um, for the selection, purchase, reception, and storage of the reagents. Always consider the requirements. And um, then you need to verify also the suitability of each batch or reagents that is critical for the test. Initially, during the shelf life, you should, should do quality control on the media. Um, where the quality of the reagents is critical to the test, you uh, verify the quality of the new batch against the outgoing batch. I, I don't know if you are doing this, but this would be really relevant. The reagents culture media always need to be labeled when you purchase them. Always is very important. You don't see it always. You have to have a good handling with the media, you close the bottles very quickly and carefully that they shouldn't crack. Mm -hmm. Never use media that has become de dehydrated. Yeah. And, um, and protect culture media. Uh, culture media dispensed in tubes or bottles or reagents that you don't use immediately against light and uh, refrigerator, uh, re refrigerate maximum three months. At room temperature, I was reading it could be kept one month. So you can have, of course, that this is what we discussed. You can prepare your media yourself or you buy ready to use media. Yeah, would be the best case, I think, because this, you know, if you think about measurement uncertainty and if you consider the storage of the media, what all could happen. So you need, first of all, get all the different media on place and it should have good quality. I know that not all suppliers have a good quality of media and since um, this um, accurate preparation of the culture media is fundamental. And then also the use of the water. I mean, water quality also has to be good and, and also controlled. I mean, in general, in, in your laboratory work, you need to control the uh, water quality. 
and uh, you also check once in a while conductivity of your water distillation apparatus and if you um, use chlorinated water I mean when uh, there is uh, this is also commercial activity of course I mean also good quality media has its price and then they, they develop more and more uh, ready to use media um, so this, this decision that the laboratory takes. I mean, when you saw the chromogenic agar, how many uh, subcomponents you have to include? Uh, then it's, it's labor, it's storage, it's uh, supplies. So you have to calculate what is better for you. And, but then also you need to get it into your country. I know that from our laboratories we are working with, they have very often had not very good results when they used low quality media. So they all went to good quality media. So why are they not the low quality media? Yeah, because the suppliers, some in yeah. some strange countries, yeah. <laughs> you have a cheaper supplier and you want to save money. And um, I don't know if they. You know, what is the definition of quality? I don't know, they don't use, um, maybe it was already um, hum humid or... Uh, yes, but the quality of media, it's a secret, well, no. <laughs> 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 so, if we have a lot of money, we use mac or soil or whatever yeah. we can. If we have less money, okay, change the SPE media for total count, so of the count grows in whatever media you are and you keep the money for a very specific one. Yeah. See. In, in Germany, uh, our bio farm is near Merck. So, they, every time they have to name a media, they say Merck. But in Argentina, Merck is quite expensive and very difficult to obtain. So, you need, for example, a media for staff and you have to wait three months. So, uh, you have to choose the best media that you can obtain yeah. and then use your own uh, internal control. Yes, yes. yes. Because that's a, that's a very problem. Okay, this is why you realize also that your media is not good it and, 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 and oh, it. Oh, very nice. I have always a negative result. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for instance, for instance, <laughs> yes, yes. But then you also need to store the media, you need to consider the re requirements and um, you have to verify shelf life, you shouldn't use expired media and keep the bottles in a dry place, away from light. So, uh, when you have to search for the best media, you have to search for the never come to the island, so you continue with this, you have to change. So you have to be very careful mm -hmm. when writing your manuals. Yeah. Don't be stuck with one brand. No. So try to describe okay. the methodology, methodology, try not to put an exact brand. Okay, I'm a brand seller. <laughs> you don't have to put the brand because if that brand disappears or you don't have any money, the money yeah. you, your validated technique is nothing. Yes, so but try to be very careful when uh, writing all this manual and taking care, okay, I have to do this, 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 and this. So maybe I take two parts of uh, this media, it's better than do. Yeah, I mean, this is why we talk, everything comes so together. Slides, even yeah. though they are hard to understand and sometimes are difficult, you have to follow them all to obtain an ability. So try to be very careful. So if you have an HPLC, even though it is old, maybe it's better to have that fixed and recovered than buy a new one. Because 
Yes, you so can also work on an old HPLC. Since the time is um, more or less um, gone, done, and we discussed the f first two days on the method, method development, the requirements very extensively. Also measurement uncertainty must be expressed. Um, I want to have a final word on the quality assurance because I think it's very relevant. And um, I put down the ISO 17025 requirements that you have to do something in the quality assurance extra for the um, assuring of the quality of your test results. And um, ISO says that you have different kind of options. This is one chapter they are dealing with. This is the chapter 5.9 of the 17025 that you need to have a planned monitoring and review regarding your quality assurance and it's limited to, but um, it could be also, uh, how to say it could be more, but what you should do is you should use cert certified reference materials, if it's possible matrix reference material, you could participate in interlaboratory comparison proficiency testing, do retesting, use duplicates, and uh, also for the trend analysis using statistical techniques uh, most commonly used are quality charts, the Schuart charts, which is being used in the chemistry. Then all your quality control data shall be analyzed and this kind of quality control program will also drive your quality. You have to con constantly assure that your results are accurate. Um, regarding the requirements, if you would be in accreditation, it's more or less that the proficiency testing becomes more and more relevant. So we have the requirements by the 17025, but also by the regulators. And in the new requirements by the, uh, for the accreditation bodies, they also need now to apply this criterion of the proficiency testing. So if you are accredited, you need to do for every test that is in scope of accreditation a PT. And the PT is the only external quality control we are having. Everything what you do in-house internally could have a bias. Yeah, so this is, has to be considered, but you apply many things like you validate the standard metho methods, you use certified reference uh, material, you repeat measurements, you use control charts and certified reference materials. Nonetheless, extra to this, before it was an option, it, 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 it changed, it goes more and more to use of certified reference materials for the validation and also to, to the uh, proficiency testing. And um, as I heard, you already have experience with the proficiency testing, or most of you. Yeah. Yeah. So you know how it works, which is good. Yeah. yeah. And um, this is a kind of commercial activity. And you, can, you need more or less, um, I don't know if I put it here. You see, um, you need now to have a four or five years planning on the PTs. This depends on the accreditation body. So the accreditation body um, um, underlies the ISO 17011. They now require that laboratories participate in p PT programs that, under, that, that are accredited by them. Before they, they were more uh, flexible, you could also have used 
reference materials. This is one link where you really are able to discuss with the accreditation body. They need to discuss with you on the proficiency testing and we have different kind of policy. The Americans, for instance, they were saying in their policy to successful participated PTs prior to any accreditation. Uh, for Europe it was one and then um, you discuss with them, um, you need to come up with the planning, but with the Americans it's I guess two years and you discuss uh, in, in, in this period uh, which about your PT scheme because we don't have for any test a PT, we don't have it running maybe so, so often. So this has to be discussed with them. There is one, for instance, there's the, this EPTIS database. I have put this also in the manual. It's very helpful. I also showed it to Christina. It's a database where you see all PTs that are running worldwide. Yeah, EPTIS. This is very recommendable because I was at EPTIS, it's, it's, um, it's um, done by BAM, it's a German institution, and it has any test that goes, not only food, and you, you select what you want to have, for instance microbiology, um, then the matrix, you can search or you have an overview. And um, the trend is also that you have more and more PTs available, you have very often the PTs available where there's a legal requirement. And then also, um, the providers can tailor your PT. There's also an option of bespoke PTs. And if you want to have an accreditation, you start contacting your, the accreditation body, and then you will discuss with them also their policy on the PTs because there's also the possibility in their guidance documents that you can group PTs if you do the same test, for instance, like E. coli, then you can maybe have less PTs, but you have to discuss this with them. I saw, because we were just checking with one of the accreditation bodies, the European one, how they handle it, and they all do it a bit differently. So they basically, what, what's the, the thumb of rule is that uh, prior to accreditation, one PT on any test that you put into scope of accreditation successfully um, participated. The set score between plus and minus two. And it becomes more relevant, the PT thing the PTs. Also the regulators might want to have extra PT, for instance for mycotoxin testing under official control. This is one of the requirements. Nonetheless you do it with your accreditation body. Okay, this I, I think we discussed uh, the, the most of the things from, from the manual. We still have the day tomorrow. There are uh, questions uh, regarding the accreditation. Because, as I mentioned, we covered mainly the technical requirements, the, the human resources and the management requirements from 17 or 25, they are also there. But um, they are not handled by our manual on the quality of funds. I would say we, we finish for the, today.